Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with this week in cannabis investing news from January 24th to the 30th. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learned something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And then of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos. Then there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and take advantage whenever you're ready. So we're going to start with a little good cop, bad cop, Ed Perlmutter being the good cop in this instance. Instance. So he announced this past week, which is great for us cannabis investors to see that again, he says, I have filed safe banking as an amendment to America competes because cannabis related businesses, big and small are in desperate need of access to capital and the banking system in order to operate in an efficient, safe manner and compete in the growing global cannabis marketplace, which is hundred percent true. So thank you, Ed, for again, not giving up and trying to put safe into any bill that you possibly can, but just keep in mind, do not get your hopes up because obviously we know that Schumer is the bad cop that is willing to take it out, especially especially if there's no social equity attached. However, there are other bills that have been introduced like the HOPE Act from Dave Joyce and AOC that could be paired with this and put in alongside. That would be ideal, but again, just while this is good news, I plan for the worst as Schumer would likely try to punt it like he did the past one. Why would he want to punt it? Well, I want to thank Mystic Captain for sharing this one. And you can actually find this link if you go to Google and you type in open secrets, money to Congress, pharmaceutical, and it will bring you to this link. Um, and why would Schumer block a sure win that allows positive federal cannabis legislation? Because he is the top recipient of big pharmaceutical money in 2022. And that would make a lot more sense as to why he really does not want to help the people that he claims to be um, you know, representing and the social equity applicants that he got vote for him. He's certainly trying to stall this as long as possible to help Big Pharma make as much money. And then if you actually were to type in beer, wine, and liquor, you can also find out that Schumer was the largest recipient of donations, which helps paint a much clearer picture as to who Schumer is actually working for, which is not the American people. It's the donors that are paying him to do nothing or to delay as long as he possibly can, which is very frustrating because the more we dig, the more the corruption does become apparent, but the reality doesn't change. And that safe is needed to make America safer because $25 billion in cash for any industry is not safe and obviously it's only the cannabis industry that has to deal with that but the pressure continues to build so i do want to show you some more examples so thank you sam reisman for sharing this one because the cannabis industry mostly cannot use banks they have to deal in cash making them target for robberies we know this but most americans don't know this or don't even care reality though washington state regulators can you imagine this just issued an advisory to shops with some tips that include train employees to be good witnesses and hire armed securities so essentially spend money that you already don't really have access to because you're a cannabis business and then train employees to be good witnesses. So make sure you maintain eye contact when someone's pointing a gun at your face. Like it's so stupid when the regulators should just be pushing for safe because the reality alongside cannabis licenses, the Liquor and Cannabis Board is aware of recent crimes against retailers in Washington state. While robberies are not exclusive to cannabis retailers, they are inherent risks that cash only businesses have that can make them targets. And the reality is, is the only businesses in the US other than illegal ones that are cash only are the cannabis industry because they have not gotten safe pass so they can't get the cash off the streets and bank like any other industry, which just makes it again ridiculous. Below are safety suggestions retailers can consider to help keep themselves and their employees safe. No, these are just bullshit. Fight to get safe passed, you useless Washington state regulators. And just some more proof though that safe is, or that the pressure is building for safe. This one comes from Marijuana Moment as federal financial regulator talks cannabis industry's bright future and a need for banking access. Federal financial regulator Rodney Hood, a board member and former chairman of the Federal National Credit Union Administration, says cannabis legalization is not a question of if, but when, reiterating what we've said in the past, and we've actually featured Rodney Hood before, a while back, and he's again offering advice on how to navigate the federal state conflict that has left many banks reluctant to work with cannabis businesses. Yeah, just remove this conflict then you won't have the conflict. During an interview with PBC conference that was released on Wednesday, Hood talked about the prohibitionist mindset that has influenced banking activity as more states have to have moved to legalize cannabis for medical and recreational use. He said that it's important for financial institutions to really prepare for what he expects uh, to be a bright future from for the cannabis sector. And so this is good to hear out of the National Credit Union Administration. And then this is the National Association of Professional Insur Insurance Agents. The PIA announces their issues of focus for 2022. And so in consultation with PIA members across the country, we have developed these 2022 issues of focus, says John Gentile, Vice President of Government Relations for PIA. While these items are our top priorities for 2022, PIA is always working to promote the interests of our independent agent members wherever those interests take us. But among PIA's issues of focus for 2022 is Cannabis Safe Harbor, which we love to see. 
as PIA strongly supports the Secure and Fair Enforcement Safe Banking Act, which would protect insurance agents and carriers from federal criminal liability for engaging in business of insurance with cannabis-related entities in states where cannabis is legal. Initially conceived as a banking-specific bill, the Safe Banking Act has been reintroduced in this Congress with several essential new insurance provisions meant to protect agents, brokers, and insurers. As PIA will advocate for Congress to include insurance agents protections in any cannabis safe harbor legislation it considers. So just wanted to add this because it's good to see that more pressure is being put on from other organizations that are affected by safe not being uh, you know, already in law. And so lastly, this is just another one that I wanted to bring up because in the past I've mentioned how the Canadian Securities Exchange is working on a second tier. And while if we don't get safe, this is the next best sort of thing that could happen in play to help us get more liquidity and allow more capital to flow into where these MSO names are listed. So just want to play this video as well now i did speed it up a little bit because otherwise it would just take a long time but so bear with me otherwise if it's too fast you can grab the link below uh, and just watch it yourself richard i want to ask you about 2022 and what that holds for the cse and, and i read in, in the newsletter that you put out you're really looking looking towards having a, a two-tier market system within the cse can you talk more about that and the significance of that yeah, it's going to be a very busy year for the team at the uh, CSE. And uh, you correctly point out with the key projects, um, we are revising the listing manual or listing rules uh, really for the first time in the more than 20 years that the exchange, or almost 20 years that the exchange has been operating. And uh, the key, one of the key factors of this uh, effort is to provide a framework that regulates the companies that we have who've stayed with us who are now significant companies. We've had uh, issuers now with market caps more than so $10 billion uh, that are growing sales uh, at a tremendous clip. And uh, they need to be regulated on a basis that is equivalent to other senior markets in Canada. And uh, we don't really want to be able to provide uh, kind of regulatory arbitrage or, or what have you. And uh, we certainly want to assure investors, regulators, and other folks in the uh, community that these companies are being looked at on the same basis that uh, their peers are on other exchanges in Canada. Now, there will be a variety of benefits for companies that uh, are on the senior tier. And I'm afraid this gets a little technical, uh, but uh, it does involve uh, the ability of these uh, companies to be eligible for reduced, reduced margin uh, when a dealer holds those uh, securities in uh, inventory overnight. That's a long-winded way of saying it'll be less expensive for companies to do deals uh, through investment dealers in Canada. Um, but we're also looking to ensure that these companies are able to join international uh, indices. Um, so we have companies from Israel, from the United States, and other, or other countries that would be eligible to be in the MSCI or the FTSE index for that particular, uh, for that particular country. And so we're working with those providers to lay the groundwork for the admission of these companies uh, to those indices as well. Uh, in addition, uh, this, we think, will give those uh, larger companies on the top tier better access to institutional investment and uh, more international access through different uh, trading systems, whether it be from the United States, Europe, and uh, Asia. When do you hope to have this, uh, this up and running? Well, it's out for public comment now. Uh, the period ends February 9th, and uh, the regulators are extremely eager to work with us to uh, bring this uh, project to fruition. So, um, you know, I always get into trouble making predictions about these sorts of things, but we certainly hope that uh, early in Q2 uh, that uh, we've been able to work uh, through uh, any remaining issues with the regulators and have the new rules in place. All right. And so just to recap, the comment period ends February 9th, which is just 10 days away, and then hopes the new rules will take effect early Q2. And from my understanding, Q1 is typically January, February, March. Q2 will be April, May, and June. And this would allow index inclusion and increase institutional investment. And while it's wise for us to prepare for the worst case scenario, which could be safe not passing at all in 2022, this is the next best thing as a backup plan that we could hope for to help allow more capital to come into these names. So just want to share some other comments for perspective. CSE doesn't want to lose MSOs. A senior tier is a great backup plan if we don't get safe this year. The CEO said it. This allows index inclusion and they are working with regulators to increase institutional investment. Nice loopholes, even if it's illegal on the federal level. While other benefits outlined eligibility to reduce margin, less expensive for investors, join international indexes, better access to institutional investments, and more international access to trading systems. So it would certainly be better than nothing. Just wanted to share that as well. So you can grab the link below if you want to watch the whole interview. On to some other news as this comes from Fox News, but just wanted to share it because it is one of the main media outlets highlighting a cause for good in the U.S. as Nancy Mace's push to legalize cannabis gets support from Amazon and that it's time to end the federal war on a plant and the federal war on people. And so I'm not going to go through this article because it just recaps everything that I've covered in past videos. just want to share that it is good to see a big outlet with a large reach showing this uh, to the American people because this is true and it is time to end this federal war on plant and the people. So on to some MSOs as Curleaf announces a revised date for fourth quarter in fiscal year end 2021. Announcing it will report its financial and operating results for the fourth quarter in fiscal year ended December 31st, 2021 after market close on March 3rd, 2022. Now this comes after Green Thumb just announced that they're 
they're going to report their earnings on March 1st. Cureleaf announced two weeks ago that they were going to report it on the 7th, 8th, or 9th of March. I forget which day it was, um, but now they're moving it up, which is great because obviously as an investor, I want to see these earnings sooner than later. It just means less time that we have to wait. On to Trulieve, as they announced closing of another 75 million private placement of 8% senior secured notes. So great to see Trulieve able to raise fairly cheap debt based on what they've been able to raise in the past, uh, especially compared to other industry competitors uh, in this space. But at the same time, they're raising debt and they're not raising any equity, which is not dilutive to existing shareholders. So we love to see that. Securelyf announced that it has closed a second tranche of its previously announced private placement of 8% senior secured notes due 2026 for aggregate gross proceeds of US $75 million. And together with the first offering of notes, which closed on October 6, 2021, Truleaf has issued notes totaling aggregate proceeds of $425 million. And the notes have the same terms as those issued on October 6, 2021, and I'm pretty sure that they um, raised this money so that they can help uh, get rid of the debt that Harvest had. So all of this is likely going to back into the business, but the press relief from the closing of the October 2021 offering can be uh, found here. If you want to check it out, the link will be below. But good news out of Trulieve as well is they are bringing the lower, lowering the cost of capital and bringing it down over time, much like the other operators, and that is going to help them in the long run. While Trulieve also announces that they are exclusively bringing Miami Mango Cannabis to South Florida market. As they announce a partnership with South Florida-based cannabis company Miami Mango, the brand's popular Mango Haze will be the first strain launched exclusively to Trulieve medical patients in the South Florida market. And it's incredible to be able to offer Miami Mango in my hometown of Boynton Beach and the region through Trulieve, the market leader in Florida, says Alex Vijegas, aka Miami Mango, CEO of Miami Mango. I know that our shared commitment to quality cannabis products and patients uh, patient care will benefit both longtime fans and those new to the Miami Mango family. So it seems like this brand has a large, you know, uh, base and recognition in Miami as well, or in Florida, obviously. So good to, again, try and bring in the top selling brands in order to drive more traffic through your stores. Begin beginning in late February, Truly will offer Miami Mango's Mango Haze in a flight to include flour, pre-rolls, oils, and concentrates. So good job, Trulieve, as well, continuing those partnerships. While Cresco announces launch of Khalifa Kush products at Cookies Dispensary throughout California. So it seems like Cresco is still being the wholesale distributor, but only for their premium partnerships now, as Wiz Khalifa's best-selling cannabis brand expands to California through an exclusive cultivation and product collaboration with the company's Flora Cal Farms and Continuum platform. And so while I've been reporting on this, just wanted to add this final snippet down here because it adds a bit more information. As Flora Cal Farms and Continuum, with their best Best in class cultivation capabilities and significant scale and penetration have proven to be the premier cultivator and distribution platform in the largest and most competitive market in the country. And we're honored to partner with their teams to expand Khalifa Kush's foot brand in California, said DJ Saul, CEO of Khalifa Kush. So it's again another effort to just focus on brands that are selling really well and using those to drive as much traffic through your stores. Um, and to get exposure to your other products as well. So good on Cresco for using this partnership and fine tuning that distribution that they had because previously, obviously they were helping a lot of other companies, probably not benefiting the most. Now this is one way that where they can optimize their distribution that they have in California and make sure that the partnerships they make are at the bottom, our bottom line affecting their margins more positively. While at the same time, Cresco expands Sunnyside and Florida's Gulf Coast with new clear water dispensary, so they're happy to announce this new Clearwater store is the company's sixth new Miami store opening in Florida, and it marks the 48th dispensary nationwide, while Cresco Labs expects to open a new Sunnyside dispensary in Miami at the end of February as well, pending city approval, which would make it their 49th location. So good job, Cresco, continuing to expand. While Canopy Growth is going to report their third quarter fiscal 2022 financial results on February 9th, 2022. So this is going to be painful, but of course we've got to go through it. And so we'll release its financial results for the third quarter fiscal year 2022 ended December 31st, 2021 before the financial market opens on February 9th, 2022. So not looking forward to that. Certainly more looking forward to March when the MSOs will be releasing their earnings as those numbers are going to be a lot more impressive. On to some other state news for marijuana moment as Delaware lawmakers approve cannabis legalization bill in a committee vote. So good to see a bill to legalize cannabis in Delaware cleared its first legislative hurdle on Wednesday, advancing out of the house House Health and Human Development Committee on a 10 to 4 vote. So good to see this out of Delaware, and I will continue to update as it makes its way through their legislature. While this one is comes out of uh, Kentech Letter, but it's a focus on Ohio, uh, basically two articles in one. The news was that Ohio could be the next big U.S. cannabis market after a cannabis advocacy group recently moved the state potentially a step closer to adult use legalization by getting the amount of signatures needed in order to ensure that it gets on the ballot. So in a sector update to clients on Wednesday, and again, this is not advice. This 
this is just coming from Jason from this article below if you wanted to read the whole thing and get more information on Ohio, is that two companies investors will want to keep an eye on in Ohio are Columbia Care and Cresco Lab. So great news out of Ohio though, as they are a state with 12 million, so it's a larger population. They've had a successful medical program for a long time, and it's great to see them push to get an adult use program accepted and launched. While this is coming out of Connecticut, state to begin accepting cannabis license applications in February. So while we have not gotten anything out of New Jersey positive, good to see this out of Connecticut as beginning next month, the Department of Consumer Protection will begin accepting applications for certain adult use cannabis licenses. The start date for the application depends on what type of license the person is seeking. And so just a bit more information, the application rounds for the eight license types that will be selected through the lottery process will open on a staggered basis. The application period for the first round of lotteries will remain open for 90 days. So basically from now going forward, um, and if it's opened on a staggered basis, I imagine they're just going to start announcing that as time goes on. But applications for social equity cultivator licenses located in disproportionately impacted areas will have a one-time 90-day application period beginning February 3rd, 2022 and ending May 4th, 2022. So good to see progress out of Connecticut. And while we're not seeing progress out of New Jersey, this is a bit more uh, more perspective worth taking in. As New Jersey's legal cannabis sales are unlikely to start in February, state may miss key decline. Why? Because the state can't do their job. As Jeff Brown, the executive director of the State Cannabis Regulatory Commission, said a number of factors are still in the way before the doors can open, including lack of municipal buy-in. There's still a lot to be done, Brown told New Jersey Cannabis Insider ahead of today's CRC meeting scheduled at 1 p.m. February 20. 22nd is not a concrete date to open. There is no firm commitment on timing of when recreational sales begin, despite the fact that state legislation S21, so by law, it directed the CRC to begin allowing sales on that date, February 22nd, six months after the rules and regulations were established by the commission. So again, it's not that they didn't, not that they can't open it, but they can't launch it. For whatever reason, they just don't want to and are taking their sweet ass time. While there's nothing more frustrating than government incompetence, there are few, if any, ways of enforcing the deadline according to one legal expert, which is annoying, especially when you consider that executives at the New Jersey Cannabis Trade Association, which represents current licensed medical cannabis growers and sellers in the state, have for months been putting pressure on the state to open the market with assurances that there is enough cannabis for medical patients and general consumers. Now, why would they be reassuring the state that there's enough? Because even Boris has said they've been growing excess for months in preparation for this. And if the CRC doesn't want to listen to them, sadly, that's the CRC's fault. But if the CRC is not following the law that the governor passed, they should be held accountable for that too, right? At some point. So on to some other states as Minnesota governor puts cannabis legalization funding in budget request. The governor of Minnesota included funding to implement cannabis legalization in his annual budget request to lawmakers on Wednesday, a move that comes while Democratic legislative leaders prepare to advance the reform again this session, even as it is stalled in the GOP-controlled Senate. As Governor Tim Walz has consistently expressed support for the policy change, but he declined to propose putting dollars toward implementation in his last budget request. Now he says he wants funding for multiple programs and departments to launch an adult use cannabis program in line with a bill that passed the Democratic controlled house last year. So good job out of Minnesota. And I will update this as we get more news as we go forward. Um, but this one also as bipartisan Tennessee lawmakers wants to put cannabis on the ballot for voters to decide, which is the right thing to do as in a somewhat odd pairing rep Bruce Griffey, a firebrand Republican from Paris and Senator Sarah Kyle, a liberal Democrat from Memphis are sponsoring legislation, enabling voters to weigh in on our uh, weigh in with a state sponsor sponsored public opinion poll, as they should. The measure Senate Bill 1973 and House Bill 1634 would require county election commissions to include three non-binding questions related to the legalization of cannabis on the 2022 ballot. The Secretary of State would then compile the results and forward them to the legislature. So great news out of Tennessee, putting this on the ballot for 2022 as they should. And so I'll provide any updates as we move forward as well. While lastly, this one out of Arkansas, former Arkansas lawmaker files cannabis legalization initiative for 2022 ballot as well. Eddie Armstrong, a Democrat who previously served as minority leader in the state House of Representatives before leaving office in 2019, first unveiled the plan to pursue legalization through the ballot late last year. Now that Armstrong's group Responsible Growth Arkansas has formally filed the measure, its details are available. And so with this amendment, the Arkansas Adult Use Cannabis Amendment would allow adults 21 and older to purchase and possess up to one ounce of cannabis, while existing medical cannabis dispensaries would be permitted to sell in the recreational market starting March 8th, 2023. And that would move pretty quickly considering the elections would be November, 2022, giving them an advantage. So there's more info here. However, apparently advocates who are collecting signatures for separate legalization ballot measures have raised concerns that the responsible growth Arkansas proposal would deliberately benefit a selection or select number of businesses, including those that have financially backed it and stamped out competition. And so while this might be 
uh, reason for concern. I don't know enough, but just wanted to share this news that at least we can expect to see some sort of legalization measure on the ballot for 2022. It's good news out of Arkansas. Well, lastly, out of Wisconsin, GOP lawmakers try again to legalize medical cannabis. So a group of Republican lawmakers resurrected a bill Wednesday to legalize medical cannabis in Wisconsin, saying it's time to at least talk about using the drug as a natural way to help the sick treat their ailments naturally. So kudos to the uh, Republican lawmakers in Wisconsin that are willing to have this conversation do the right thing and provide an alternative safe medicinal alternative in their state well some studies this one comes from the american nurses association as they publish a position statement reiterating that the nurses american nurses association support for the review and reclassification of cannabis's status from a federal schedule one controlled substance to facilitate urgently needed clinical research to inform patients and providers on the efficacy of cannabis and related cannabinoids love to see this out of the american nurses association as they recommend it is the shared responsibility of professional nursing organizations to speak up for nurses collectively in shaping healthcare and to promulgate change for the improvement of health and healthcare. Therefore, the ANA, A, ANA strongly supports uh, all of this that's listed here. So you can pause to read if you want. Obviously, there's a lot more info on here if you want to grab the link below and check it out. But great to see this as this is the sort of push that we need from organizations to get cannabis descheduled so that we can finally study it. Well, this one comes from... Um, foot and ankle orthopedics, but from Sage Journals. But again, not many studies that we refer to cannabis touch on any foot or ankle orthopedics whatsoever. So I wanted to grab this study, which I found interesting, came from January 2021, Influence of Medical Cannabis on Mensachymal stromal cell osteogenesis, uh, an in vitro study. And so basically, just to go to the results quickly, conclusion, this suggests that cannabidoil treatment might lead to improvements in fracture healing and provide a novel therapeutic option for bone regeneration. So try and tell me cannabis is not God's medicine, right? Future studies are aimed at characterizing the CB1 and CB2 signaling associated with the changes observed here and the effects of WIN on MSC-derived osteoblasts in the context of inflammation. And so as we learn more, we learn that we need to deschedule the damn plant so we can find out all of the ways that its compounds can actually help the human body in ways that we couldn't have even imagined if it wasn't for certain studies like this. Well, lastly, this one comes from Sirius. There's another one just highlighting that medical cannabis use reduces opioid prescriptions in patients with chronic back pain. And I love to see that this one's actually peer reviewed. So happy to say that. And this was published January 20th as the conclusion, medical cannabis use reduces opioid prescription for patients with chronic back pain and improves pain and disability score. And for that reason, we have to take a stand and we have to do whatever we can to try and get cannabis descheduled. And 2022 is the year to hold your government accountable for their broken campaign promises and actually make it happen. Well, lastly, we're going to round off with this MJ Biz Daily article highlighting that Canada's recreational cannabis sales could reach 4.8 billion Canadian dollars this year, which would be 19% more than 2021's estimated figures. A new report from ATB Capital Markets anticipates the estimate is slightly lower than ATB's previous forecast for 2020 of Canada's 4.9 billion. So, well, it's nice to see the Canadian market continue to expand in its third year and thank you Ontario for opening more stores and allowing this expansion the 4.8 billion Canadian dollars is really just 3.8 billion US dollars and that 3.8 billion US dollars is like one sixth of the amount that the US is going to do in sales in 2021 and when you consider that the US only has 12 states that have launched adult use programs six that are still waiting to come online and then 32 states that have yet to reform their laws the total addressable market will continue to expand in the US and that is why the main opportunity especially in more undervalued but stronger fundamental companies is in the US multi-state operators as opposed to the Canadian LPs but that is not advice just my perspective that is it for today's episode folks i want to thank you so much for tuning in and i really hope you got some value out of this episode what did you think of the stories mentioned let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions and i'd be happy to address them but besides that if you enjoyed this video and you learned something please just leave a like on it subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos and i will catch you on wednesday for a midweek update have a great weekend everybody